Welcome to another scripture discussion focusing on teachings and doctrines of the Book of Mormon. My name is Dana Pike. I'm a professor of ancient scripture at uh, Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And I'm joined today by three of my colleagues from ancient scripture, Tyler Griffin, Keith Wilson, and John Hilton. Pleasure to be with you all. And uh, today we have the opportunity to discuss 2 Nephi 6 through 10, which is uh, five, which are five chapters of scripture that we don't necessarily always read together, but they, they go together very nicely. It's Jacob's sermon uh, as recorded by and included by Nephi in his uh, account in 2 Nephi. And I thought before we get too far into it, we could at least uh, do a little bit of contextualization. Why is this here? How is Nephi using it? Uh, how far into their journey since they left Jerusalem are we when, we when we get to this point? So who'd like to help us out a little bit? Right before 2 Nephi chapter 6, in 2 Nephi chapter 5, verse 34, Nephi says that 40 years have passed away. And this is clearly now since they left Jerusalem. Since they left Jerusalem. Yeah. So if Jacob's born in the wilderness, he's maybe in his mid-30s as he's giving this address. And this is at this point, 2 Nephi 5 ends the storyline of the Book of Mormon. So from here on out, it's going to be a core focus on doctrine. And Nephi's choosing to lead out with Jacob on that. Okay, and when we get to Jacob chapter 1, verse 1, uh, Jacob says it's been 55 years since they left Jerusalem. So we're somewhere in that 15-year period between 40 and 55 years. So yeah, Jacob's 30s, 40s maybe at the most, but uh, good. What else should we know about it, contextually speaking? It looks like Jacob has received the assignment uh, from his brother Nephi uh, to give this passage, and you notice that he was set apart just in that previous chapter, uh, consecrated as a priest and a teacher, uh, and I find that interesting because now he, you see him uh, kind of rising to the challenge and, uh, and joining really the prophetic voice. I also love how Jacob does a great job of modeling what Nephi had invited everybody to do with likening all scriptures unto us that it might be for our profit and our learning, and I think that's where it ties in here. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes when you read scripture in ancient history, it's easy to get so caught up in the ancient history that we don't bridge the gap back to our own time and liken it to us. For me, one of, the, one of the beautiful insights that comes out of this introductory material of Jacob is right there at the very end of verse 4 when he says, I speak unto you for your sakes that you may learn and glorify the name of your God. Then he's going to go into reading some Isaiah chapters, giving his commentary in chapter 9, and then that night, an angel comes to him and teaches him the name of Christ. So for the first time in the Book of Mormon, we get the name of Christ associated with the Redeemer. And he says, you can learn and glorify the name of your God. And Jacob learned, and now he's going to glorify the name of Christ from here on out. Later on, Nephi is going to do the same thing after giving all of that big chunk of Isaiah. It's in chapter 25 when he gets the name revealed, Jesus. Christ for the first time in the Book of Mormon. So it's interesting as we read scriptures individually or as families today, let's not, let's not overshoot or look beyond the mark, as Jacob would say, but let's look for Christ and we will learn and be able to glorify his name as we liken these scriptures to us. That's a great nugget, Tyler. And so Jacob, who uses Isaiah 49, I think it's verses 22 and 23, he quotes those. Nephi had quoted them in 1 Nephi 21. Now Jacob quotes them at the beginning of 2 Nephi chapter 6 in the sense of the standard we set up, the Gentiles, the nations, right? The rulers and leaders of nations are going to help in the Lord's plan to bring people back. And so he keeps, keeps going back and forth between these Gentile nations and remnants of Israel or branches of Israel have been scattered throughout the world. And then in verses 16 through 18 of chapter 6, this is looping us directly back to where the last, these are the last verses of Isaiah that Nephi had quoted back in 1 Nephi 21. So he finishes Isaiah 49 and then in chapter 7 does Isaiah 50 and into 51. So there's this clear 48, 49, 50, 51 that we might miss if we're not looking carefully. And if we have a tendency to want to skip Isaiah. <laughs> but Jacob and Nephi find such worth and richness and power in Isaiah's writings. And I think that's it's a good encouragement for us to 
yeah. go and do likewise, right? All right, Keith, what did you want to say? Anything uh, about chapter 7 or 8? Well, the great uh, little insert, I think, is Jacob is really hooked into Isaiah here, but also the covenant. You notice the way he ends in 18. <laughs> uh, the I, the Lord, 6 verse 18. Uh, yeah, 6 verse 18, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, and then he gives him what title? The Mighty One of Jacob. I think there's a little bit of, <laughs> of <laughs> Jacob the likes to kind of see the connection. So that's in the Hebrew Bible, it's on the brass plates, but he's got a personal that's connection right. there. He likes that name. Which, by the way, sometimes we overlook the messenger, we, we jump into the message. But Jacob's a real person and he's very distinct from Nephi and he has his own his own personality and it's fun to see that come out in the way that he couches doctrines or the way that he gives examples or teaches. Let's do 2 Nephi 7 and chapter 8. These are quotations of Isaiah 50 and 51. These some nice rhetorical questions here. Is my hand shortened that I can't redeem you? Do I not have power to deliver you? Again, this rhetoric, the answer obviously is no. His hand isn't shortened. Yes, he does have power to deliver them uh, if they'll come to him. And so this emphasis on um, don't be rebellious anymore, the power of the covenant and my grace and power as the Lord will I'm going to reach out and bring you back. And I think, I think Jacob really is talking about Jacob as an individual. I think that was traumatic in a way for him. Born in the wilderness, never knew the, the, the holy land, homeland from which his family left. And he, he mentions it both in this sermon, mm -hmm. but also in the book of Jacob, like, you know, we're cut off and we're not getting back in my lifetime nor in, in you know, his, con his contemporaries' lifetimes either. I think there was a real longing and a, almost a sense of trauma there that you uh, have to wait for the future, but it's not going to be in our time, right? And so I, th I love the emphasis here on the Lord has the power to bring back. One thing I would like to point out here is that sometimes in, in the latter days as we read Isaiah particularly, it can get pretty frustrating because it's not a comfort zone for most people. It's, it's a different language, it's a different uh, literary technique that he's using and a lot of people can get really confused. It's interesting that Nephi and Jacob feel very comfortable, very confident in their reading and interpreting of Isaiah and so the Book of Mormon pattern is very clear that if they're going to, if they're going to give us an Isaiah chapter or a block of chapters, they will always intro those chapters and then they will give commentary on what they got out of those chapters, what they mean to them and, and how they've likened them to, to their own time. And so, for, for readers today, I think it's important to not just jump over to chapter 9 and 10 because it's Jacob's words and it's really powerful, but to first keep those in context of this is Jacob's commentary on what he got from reading Isaiah chapter 50 and 51. And so instead of being so confused by chapters uh, 7 and 8 here, we would be benefited by reading them carefully and then going to chapter 9 and 10 and seeing the allusions, the metaphors, the comparisons, the crossover that Jacob's making and will help us unlock our understanding of, of Isaiah. It's like, I love this little, this little play on words, not play on words, but this use of words here in chapter 8. Um, verse 9, and again, this is from Isaiah 51, but we're in 2 Nephi 8, verse 9, uh, awake, awake, put on the strength, O arm of the Lord, right? So it's as if the Israelites are saying to the Lord, hey, get up, use your powerful arm, you defeated the dragon, the, the powers of chaos in the creation, verse 10, aren't you the one that dried up the waters? This sounds like it's the Exodus, uh, the Red Sea, and so on, and delivered your people. So it's as if the Israelites are saying, hey, Lord, wake up and, and help us out. And then when we get a little further, verse 17, awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem. Now the Lord's using that language and flipping it back towards the Israelites uh, and saying, get up, and wake up spiritually, and then verse 24 again, which is now Isaiah 52, verse 1, uh, awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion, put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem. And so just, there's a literary dimension to this too, and when we, if we can appreciate that, it oftentimes helps us to enjoy the spiritual dimension as well. So the Israelites saying, hey Lord, wake up and help us, and he's saying, yeah, wake up, I'm happy to help you as soon as you're with me on the same page here. So. Jacob here really wants to wants to put an incredible emphasis on this mighty one of Jacob, this redeemer, and he's 
picked up on those themes and now he wants to unpackage it. And so he says, lift up your heads, look at like verse three, rejoice. Uh, the Lord's going to, going to redeem you uh, and, uh, and the likes. And so this chapter becomes really uh, Jacob's kind of look at the really good part, the finale, the thing that makes everything work together and that's the atonement. He does give us some doctrine in the atonement, but mostly it's the affective part of the atonement. It's the way that it just is such an incredible piece of the puzzle and how it fits together. We'll have lots of other doctrinal expositions in, in the scriptures about the atonement, but here he, you notice his, his big thrust is, oh, how great, oh, how good, oh, how holy, oh, how just. These are, these are emotional kind of expressions of this really makes sense, you know? And so when I teach this, I usually like to refer to this, this affective approach to, to this plan of salvation as the O's and the woes. You know, it's just the real, look at this, look at how good it is uh, versus look at people that overlook the atonement and how much they miss in life. So that's kind of my, my overarching one uh, on chapter nine. Which, which is kind of a double-edged sword for Jacob, isn't it? The, these, the cheery O's, so to speak, and the dreadful woes. He's got this beautiful message, and yet he's seeing that some people are gonna, the, the people in Jesus' time are gonna reject him, some of the Nephites in his own day are gonna reject him, and it's so frustrating to him. It's fascinating that he is the, the prophet in the Book of Mormon to use the word anxiety more than anybody else. He uses it you know, three or four times, that he has great anxiety for these people, I think partly because of what you just said. Here's this great message and you're not, the, the, the Redeemer's gonna gather you and bring you back, but you don't wanna be brought back. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe my favorite of those is in verses 20 through 22. Oh, how great the holiness of our God, for he knoweth all things, and there is not anything save he knows it. And he cometh into the world that he may save all men if they will hearken unto his voice, for behold, he suffereth the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children, who belong to the family of Adam. And he suffereth this, that the resurrection might pass upon all men." And I've been doing a little bit of, of kind of studying recently as far as what people uh, have said about the Atonement in General Conference. And this theme here of, he suffereth the pains of all men, has been really pronounced in the last 40 years. Prior to 1980, it was very occasionally mentioned, but now I think this is something that we're coming to understand more and more. I could be wrong, I think there's only four or five verses in all of scripture that talk about this aspect of the atonement, Jesus Christ suffering our pains. And so I think that's a really important doctrinal contribution of this sermon. And it's not just the pains of uh, every living creature, men, women, children, he understands what that feels like for each one of us. And that's really powerful. That's, that's the first time in the Book of Mormon where you get that. And then King Benjamin's going to pick that up. Elmer the Younger's going to pick that up. Abinadi's going to pick that up later on. That's powerful. Another, another first is he's the one, I believe, that is the first to mention the infinite atonement. He yeah, used, which used, is a phrase that will come again later in Elmer. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, it's the first, first time we have, where is that? Uh, that's in verse 7. Uh, and then a second uh, and third piece of doctrine that he's introducing is without the atonement, we would have been angels to a devil in verse 9. And that's also something that's really uh, fresh and new. And there's a statement that President Hunter made in General Conference uh, a number of years back. And he said, perhaps many of us may not have fully glimpsed uh, the significance and the spiritual grandeur of the resurrection and atonement. If we had, we would marvel at its beauty, as did Jacob. So mm -hmm. President Hunter saw Jacob just marveling at the beauty of the atonement in chapter 9. Right. Overcoming spiritual death, physical death, yeah. all the pains yeah. and the sorrows. Great. Okay. I wanted to mention one more thing before we, if we push further into chapter 9. I'm looking at verses 12 and 13. I, I love the way... And again, we only have the English, so we don't know exactly the language, the words, the vocabulary that, that Jacob was using. But based on our English translation, which we have, I love the way that the language that Jacob uses when he's reading and commenting on Isaiah, 
and the language he uses here when he's talking about what we would say plan of salvation kinds of things, right? Death, atoning sacrifice, redemption. So in chapter 9, verse 12, he talks about death and hell must deliver up their dead. Hell must deliver up, verse 13, um, the paradise of God must deliver up the spirits of the righteous. The grave is going to deliver up the body. The spirit in the body is restored to itself again. And so we've had this deliverance of the house of Israel that's been broken apart and scattered around the earth and how God through his power will restore them. But we also have the same terms used in relation mm -hmm. to body and spirit as part of the individual aspects of the plan of salvation. So and if I could just tie that back to 2 Nephi chapter 6, verse 17, the captives of the mighty shall be taken away, the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, sometimes people wonder, why should we read these Isaiah chapters? Shouldn't we just skip over them? And I think that's, that's the beauty is if you can see the connections between what Isaiah is teaching. Jacob's not just quoting Isaiah in a vacuum and then like, okay, got that out of the let's way. Now, right. like, let's talk about what I really want to talk about. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, there's the connections there that are so rich. Nephi in 2 Nephi 25 is going to say that among other keys for understanding Isaiah is to know the geography and to know the history, know the contemporary things that are happening with the Jewish people. And so when you understand the story arc of the captivity and the deliverance that the Jewish people experience uh, during almost this exact time, right, between 600 and 500 BC, right. and then to see the beauty of that in the plan of salvation for you and me is really powerful. Yeah, and so Jacob is using Isaiah to talk about scattering and gathering the house of Israel, the Lord's covenants, the Lord's power to fulfill his covenants. He's also trying to give his people hope. And Isaiah is a hope-filled collection of prophecies. I mean, there's plenty of woe and judgment, right? But as you look, especially the latter portion of the book of Isaiah, as we have it arranged, and a lot of it gets picked up here by Nephi and Jacob and first and second Nephi, there's that sense of hope, right? That you can look to the future and that God can and will deliver you uh, individually and collectively mm. as his covenant people. And so uh, that's one of the great virtues, the values of, of studying, spending more time and thinking about uh, the teachings of Isaiah. So what are the major points in your mind uh, that, that are included in, in 2 Nephi 10 as we have it here at the, at the conclusion and wrap up of Jacob's sermon? Well, he, he does tie back to some of the Isaiah verses that we read back in 2 Nephi chapter 6, right? In verse 9, Yea, kings of the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers unto them. Queens shall become their nursing mothers. But now he shifted it into the latter days, uh, talking about a latter day gathering. So this typology is not just for the personal plan of salvation, but latter day gathering. And he's bringing us back to the one more reason why it's so important to study Isaiah. Jacob is coming back to it to talk about the latter days. Yeah, good. Okay, yeah, it's Isaiah 49, what is it, verse 23, I think. So we got it in Nephi, we got it in Jacob twice, we have it twice in Jacob, right. and so, uh, good. What else? Keeps bringing it up. It's interesting because he, he picks up a theme from Nephi and referring to, in verse 16 of chapter 10, the, the whore of all the earth, this great and abominable church. Mm -hmm. He gives us, in my mind, from my perspective, one of the clearest definitions of yes. what that is, in verse 16, wherefore he that fighteth against Zion, both Jew and Gentile, both bond and free, both male and female, shall perish, for they are they who are the whore of all the earth. And they who are not for me are against me, saith our God. That's a, Jacob's pretty bold. Yeah, no, that's a great, his declaration. great insight there. Again, some exhortation in the middle of verse 20, let us remember him and lay aside our sins. He's talking, Jacob, specifically to his own audience, but uh, by extension, giving us some good exhortation as well. And at the end of verse 22, again, Jacob twining together the personal salvation available through our Redeemer, but also this collective family, covenant family salvation, right? He's led people away time and time from the house of Israel. Uh, they've been broken off, wherefore he remembers us also. We're part of the group that's been, one of the groups broken off, but he remembers us collectively and individually. And I think there's such power here as he closes, at least Nephi's version of the close of Jacob's sermon. So cheer up again and remember that we are free to act, to choose what we want, life or death. 
And let's just read the last two verses. I think that would be a, a fitting conclusion here. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, reconcile yourselves to the will of God and not to the will of the devil and the flesh. And remember, after you are reconciled unto God, that is only in and through the grace of God that you are saved. Who does this sound like? Who else does this sound like? It's an awful lot like Nephi. It sounds like Nephi, and it reminds me of Moroni at the end of chapter 10, Moroni 10, at the very yeah. end of the Book of Mormon as well. Wherefore, verse 25, may God raise you up from death by the power of resurrection, and also from everlasting death by the power of the atonement, that you may be received into the eternal kingdom of God, that ye may praise him through grace divine. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, one of my favorite verses here is in chapter 9, verse 26. For the atonement satisfies the demands of justice on all who have not the law given to them, that they are delivered from that awful monster, death and hell, the devil, the lake of fire and brimstone. You know, I don't think the main reason why we should be good is to avoid fire and brimstone. But I, I can actually remember a family home evening we had when I was 11 years old. And we read this chapter, and honestly, I started thinking about death and hell. And where do I really want to be? And that's kind of like put a little bit of fear of God in me as an 11 year old. And sometimes I think that's helpful. And Jacob is teaching some very strong messages because maybe his people and maybe some of us need to remember that there is a reality of the afterlife. And through Jesus Christ, we can have a beautiful afterlife. But if we reject Jesus Christ and his message, there are real consequences to that. Whenever I think of this chapter and the, and, the, and the constant focus of the essential nature of Jesus Christ and his atonement, I can't help but uh, reflect on the ward that I moved into recently. And I met a family there and I just brought a picture and the family was a blended family and uh, of like 14 kids. But in the first family there, the mother had died um, and I brought her picture she had uh, been a convert to the church and she felt very deeply about uh, having children and raising a righteous family. And when she was having her in the process of pregnancy and having her seventh children, seventh child, <laughs> she was diagnosed with cancer, a rapidly spreading form of cancer. And the doctor said, uh, I strongly encourage you, he was not LDS, to uh, abort the child and we can save your life. We can arrest this. And she said, uh, that's too great a sacrifice. Uh, I'll take my chances. And the little child was born. Here, I'll just show you a little picture. I have it in my folder here. And here's the day of the birth. And then here's the child uh, as a two or three year old. And the child was born uh, and, uh, and the mother died a month or two afterwards. Uh, and I can't, that child now is a, is a married woman herself. I can't help but think that she walks around because her mother gave her life. And in Jacob's perspective, we walk around because Jesus presented the ultimate sacrifice. It's beautiful. One of my favorite parts about the way Jacob approaches the, the fall and our redemption from the fall is the fact that today we can get so overwhelmed with black words on a white page that we either give up trying to understand them or relate them to us, or we can get so overwhelmed with the programs of the church and all of the things that we're expected to do. And I love the fact that Jacob brings it back to the fact that there's only one thing that's going to save us, and it's not what I do. It's what Jesus did for me, and it's figuring out how to reconcile myself unto the will of God, find out what he wants me to do. And so all of these things that we do in life, whether it's read our scriptures, pray, go to church, go to the temple, even the covenants, none of those things will save us by themselves. It's Jesus who saves us. And all of those things become connecting points to Christ. They bring us to him and help change us and help us become more like him. And that's what salvation is. It's not just being taken from this earth and sent somewhere onto a cloud to float around forever. It's to actually change. And Jesus changes us as we turn our life over to him and reconcile our will to his will. And then, even then, it's only through the grace of God that we are saved.
and I'm so grateful for his willingness to care so much about one so small as me. Yeah, well said. Man. Well, we've had a few minutes, not enough, obviously, but uh, at least a few minutes to talk about Second Nephi 6 through 10, Jacob's sermon. Uh, we hope our audience was able to enjoy the power of this and some of the major themes that are included in this message. I appreciate uh, having this opportunity to discuss with you and with all of you. And we hope that you will find great power both in the teachings of the Lord as they come through Isaiah, as they come to us through Nephi and Jacob in the Book of Mormon, and have, a, have an abiding conviction that it is our Savior, Jesus Christ, who does have the power to redeem us from sin and death and bring us home to our Father in heaven. Amen.